with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Love endures forever, for the life that's been reborn. Love endures forever, sing praise, sing praise, sing praise. Yeah.
pray together tonight. Our Heavenly Father, we do thank you, Lord, as we as we take just a few minutes, dear Lord, to set our eyes on you, Father, and recognize again, dear Lord, how, how beautiful you are, how great and mighty and powerful you are, Lord. I thank you for who you are tonight, dear Lord, and I pray that you would move and work in this place, Lord. Give us an even greater understanding of who you are, Lord, and of who we are supposed to be in you, Father. I pray that you would bless uh, bless this evening, Lord. I pray, Father, that you would break our hearts for missions, break our hearts for what you are doing uh, around the world, Father. I pray that you would move and work in this place through the Holy Spirit in Jesus. Amen. Amen. Good evening. Good evening. It's good to see you back this evening. It's going to be a good evening. We're going to have a couple of missionaries come and share with us in just a little bit. I do have some corrections of announcements. <laughs> yeah. Who would have who guessed it? Okay. There is no meeting on August the 2nd. It's August the 5th for the Iwana meeting. Okay? The 2nd is not a Sunday. Now, I'm just going to tell you, I spoke what was spoken unto me. <laughs> so, I'm going to throw Brother Doug under the bus on that one, and you can tell him those. And while I'm at it, how many of y'all looked at the uh, bulletin this today? <laughs> Attendance last Sunday. Now, every eye closed, every head bowed. Who were the two people who were here <laughs> last Sunday? <laughs> we want to get you on the road and have you checked off. And I, you know, I pointed it out to Brother Doug. He had taken out the two other numbers. He said, I'm just going to add the other two and correct it. Well, so anyway, if you just want to take a picture of that and text that to him, you know, that would probably be inappropriate. I didn't say that. Okay. Also, after the service, Miss Cleta has some boxes that need to be taken out of her car, right, and brought into the church. So if we could have some of the men right after church go out and give her a hand, a young man, and you notice that there's mothers pointing at their son. So... Also, though it was not announced this morning, and it's going to be impromptu now, and we can add to it later, but uh, after the time tonight, well, we'd like to take an off for the missionaries speaking for Kelsey and Nathan as they will be coming here in a little bit and sharing with you about their ministry and their mission and their training and what they're looking forward to and what is ahead of them. And I'm looking forward to this, and it's going to be good to hear from them. I know it may be short for a while, but they have presented put together a presentation for us, and we look forward to that. So let's have a word of prayer, and uh, is there any other announcements that were spoken wrong this morning, or we missed, or something like that? I have a question. What time is that meeting Sunday? Four o'clock. Four o'clock. Well, do you know there's no choir practice, so it's set at four, but the Putnam Baptist. Well, I'll tell you what. When the pastor comes back, yeah. <laughs> he can change that, <laughs> and we will put it in the bulletin. Maybe we'll put it in the book. We have it correct. It all depends. Maybe there were those other people who didn't come that night, that Sunday, but the other two. Okay, let's have a word of prayer. Now, Father, we thank you. Lord, it is so good to be in the fellowship of believers. Father, to be with those who are in the body of Christ that you have placed with us here at Westside First Baptist Church. And Father, as the psalmist said, how good it is. It is holy, like the oil dripping off of the hair and the beard of Aaron. Father, chosen, a holy priesthood. Father, thank you. Thank you that you have placed us in the bride of Christ. Thank you that we are here because the mind of Christ knows we are to be here, right here, in service for him and for the kingdom of God. And we praise you for that. Be with us this evening, Father, as we hear these two speak and share with us. Be with us as we open your word for a thought. And then, Father, be with us as we look to the week ahead how we might serve you and glorify you in all that we do. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Paul, are we good? Okay. I'd like to introduce to you Kelsey and Nathan Brindle, and they are with New Tribes. I, I thought that was correct. I'm going, I don't think I missed that. But <laughs> After this morning, I'm really kind of shaking. <laughs> uh, we changed the name to Ethno 360. That's right. So that's, yeah. that's true. So I was going to correct it. Thank you. You guys take home and do as you would like. Is this mic good? Okay. Which one do you want? Either one. You 
We're good. Hearing this guy at this point, 
I was still trying to figure out where I was supposed to fit, what was the best fit for me, and um, I hated Papua New Guinea while I was there. I was sick for five of the six weeks that I was there with Giardia, hated all the food, couldn't eat any of it. It was disgusting. And I just was like, what? How, how am I supposed to live here? Maybe there's somewhere better in mind that God has in mind for me. And whenever I read this letter, I just realized my selfishness in that and um, my desire for, for me to live my ideal version of the perfect life without suffering. Because in America, I, I, did, I didn't understand that suffering was just part of the Christian life because I, I thought my comforts were something that I was owed. And so um, when I heard this guy's need, and I, I realized the only thing that is keeping this man from hearing the gospel is people like me who are saying, maybe there's something better out there for me. And so I, I realized my pride in that, and I, I knew I want to come back here. I want to be, uh, I want to be one of the people. I want, I want to see one of the tribes come to know the Lord. I want to share that with those, with those people. And um, so that's what my husband and I are going to do. Papua New Guinea has over 850 distinctly different languages, and the vast majority of those are still unwritten. So what we're going to go do while, I, while we're there, um, first we have to learn the language. There's no Rosetta Stone to help us. It's just sitting down and pointing at things until we can pick up the language well enough to where we can form sentences and ask questions and things like that. So after we've learned the language, we're going to create an alphabet for them. We're going to teach them reading and writing in their own language so that one day we can, trans we can translate the Bible into their own language and they can have it long after we're gone. Um, we're going to stay until we can... Um, see believers discipled and appoint elders and leaders and Bible teachers in the church so that the, the church is functioning all on their own. They're not dependent on us as missionaries, and we can just leave a thriving church in their hands. And so Nathan's going to talk about um, where he came from and, and what we're up to right now. Yeah, so I grew up at FNO 360 headquarters. Um, that's in San Francisco, Florida. And my parents were actually missionaries. <laughs> Sorry. My parents were missionaries with FNS 360, formerly. Oh, known sorry, as you can go to the next tribe or next <laughs> picture too. Yeah, so that's me. Um, and the reason why my parents were missionaries stateside was because I have a sister. Her name was Joy, and she had cerebral palsy. And the needs that she had kept us um, in uh, Florida. So my parents had ministries that serve other missionaries. And so I grew up as a missionary kid uh, in Florida. And there I got to hear stories, um, just like the one Kelsey told every day, um, from tribes all over the world, missionaries coming home, sharing these stories. And I got burdened at a really young age um, to go and tell, um, proclaim good news. And so when I uh, finished high school, I did some college, and then I went on to training. Um, Ethnos 360 has four years of training um, to send their missionaries. And the first uh, two years is Bible training. And that is in Waukesha, Wisconsin. That's where we met, and that's where we've been for the past two years. And there we got to learn God's word chronologically, beginning in Genesis and ending in Revelation. We got to learn systematic theology. We got to learn um, really how to be lifelong learners of the word. Because if one of our goals in life is to translate the Bible and translate a New Testament into an unwritten language. We really want to know the Bible. And so that's what we just spent two years doing. And so now our step is to, our next step is to move to Roach, Missouri, um, in, Ozark, in the Ozarks, Lake of the Ozarks. And that's where the Missionary Training Center is. And you can actually go to the next slide. This was... Oh, that was a Bible school. You can go to the next one. Whoops. So there we're going to learn really practical. <laughs> we're going to learn really practical missions methodology. We're going to learn um, how to learn an unwritten language. We're going to learn phonetics, phonemics. Those are tools um, that we will use to write a language down. And uh, we're going to learn um, survival. Oh yeah, you go to the next yeah. one. We're going to learn uh, just practical things about living in the tribe. Uh, where we will be living, it's in the jungle, and it's remote, and so we'll be living off of solar panels. So I'll learn how to wire and keep up solar panels and things like that. Um, and most of our, yeah, most of our classes are discussion-based, and this October we're actually expecting 
boy, um, and this is what our life is going to be like. We're going to be sitting in classes learning um, our what we want to do, how to do what we want to do for the next few years, and our son will be with us the whole time. <laughs> yeah. It's pretty great. They let you bring your baby to class up to like a year old. They have child care, but for the first year of his life, he we get to be a family unit together, and uh, we're really excited for that. That's an awesome opportunity that not many people in America get to have, you know, when they work a nine-to-five job. They, families can, can, you know, you go off to work, one parent goes to work, or one parent stays with a child, or they both go off to work. And we get to, for the rest of our life, foreseeably, that we can see, we get to live together and we get to share in this ministry as a family, which we're really pumped about. Um, so the tribe that I, I told you guys about, Hewa, the man, or, I'm sorry, not Hewa, uh, Maliali is the tribe that, um, that man sent a letter from, and I just want to tell you guys, that man did receive missionaries in um, th this past Christmas. They got missionaries in their tribe, so praise God for that. But uh, Nathan's about to undo a scroll, and this, uh, th not only in Papua New Guinea are there tons and tons of people groups begging for the gospel, but these are all of the unreached people groups left in the world. There is a huge task ahead of us. There's a huge task for the church ahead of us. Uh, <laughs> that all the way enrolled? It is, it is vast. Um, this is a, a, a document that Wycliffe put out of all the remaining unreached people groups, all the, um, the people that are left that don't have God's word. And we're, this motivates us. It keeps us wanting to uh, head towards this goal so that we can tick off one of these names of the list. And, and we want you guys to be a part of that. We want the body of Christ to come together to help uh, share help share the gospel to these people groups so that they can know the word, they can know God as well. Um, and our organization, we is we are a little bit different than how the IMB goes about it. We support Raise for all of our financial needs. So we have individual people and churches who send to us, who give to us monthly. And um, we are currently about 70% of what we need for in monthly continual donations um, to just finish the training. So it's a bit different about how the IMB does it. We really, um, it's hard, it's very difficult, but we really enjoyed those relationships that we've been able to cultivate through support raising. It's been awesome. We have incredible prayer warriors behind us. My grandma will probably be at the top of that list. And... Um, we, we have the prayer, and we have accountability. We know these people are, are giving up what they earn to, towards the gospel, and it, it motivates us. It wants us to, um, it, it holds us to a higher standard of accountability than we would have any, in any other way. And, and it also allows people to just come alongside us and be a part of this ministry and actually see right along with us all the fruits of their labors, of our labors. Um, so... We would love if you guys, if anyone would love to join us in that, or um, we would really, really just appreciate your prayers as well. We send out a newsletter if you guys would like to get that, let me know. But we also have, you can go to the next uh, picture. We have in the back some prayer cards um, and then some brochures that just kind of explain our ministry a little bit better than we did. So if you guys would like that, um, it's in the back, or you can come find us afterwards. Thank you guys so much. Just in closing, um, my brother, brother Roger talked this morning about Muhammad, he didn't give us his name, but he asked you your goal, right? And um, we just want you guys to know, like, our goal really is to see a thriving church and an unreached people group, and uh, we hope you guys will pray with us for that. Yeah, thank you. to stand and gather around them, please do so. Let's lift them up.
uh, they, they might uh, do as you have called them to do, Lord God. We thank you, dear God, for who you are within their life and what you're doing, dear God, through them and in them and around them, dear God. We pray for direction each step of the way that uh, they would uh, be in your line and your, your uh, way, dear Jesus God. And we thank you for this. We give you all the praise for these, uh, this couple, dear God, for Nathan and Chelsea. And we just thank you, dear God, for their commitment, dear God, to you and to the people they're going to. And we praise you and we honor you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 People might come. Yeah. Let's take a love offering. If you're not prepared, that's okay. You know, the way we do this, there's often opportunities and they'll be added in. But let's begin with that. As I shared with you, they will be doing a faith ministry. You know, you may want to consider what that means. Uh, a part of your budget, a part of your giving, a part of uh, reaching out and giving to this young couple. Now, I ask you to please, if this is something that you consider, pray about it. Pray strong. Because it's not something that you want to endeavor and then stop. There's nothing worse than saying, I am going to give on a monthly basis and then not do it. Or give on a regular basis and not do it. Because when you get overseas and all of a sudden that commitment and that pledge and that promise has been given and does not come in, it impacts the family greatly. But it is the way the Lord asked us to give. And so be in prayer about that. And get a chance to meet this young couple. I encourage you to get their newsletter. Uh, I've been receiving it for quite some time now, and I love to catch up. And they're really gifted in letting you know what they're about and what their ministry is about. So please, think about this, pray about it. And if you don't have opportunity tonight, be sure you know, you'll have other opportunities come Wednesday or even next Sunday. Thank you. Good. Now then, I'm going to say this. We went overseas the first time and our daughter was 18 months old and she corrected everything we ever said in Arabic from then on. <laughs> you, you have the greatest tool for teaching you the language because that child will learn very quickly and will have perfect pronunciation. And to this day, after 30 some odd years in the Middle East, my Arabic is still with a southern accent. <laughs> My pastors made fun at conferences of trying to speak like Brother Roger. Let us now preach like him. And Arabic in the southern accent is rather funny, so we won't go there. We're going to miss that if we might. I know that we are covering and don't have a lot of time, but, you know, we were talking about discipleship today, and I'd like to pick that back up. Uh, talking, if you would, some things about Paul. In 1 Corinthians Chapter 11, verse 23, and I, we won't have to read all this, but I just want to read this one verse to you, and then we're going to pick up in 2 Timothy. Paul is writing this, this famous passage, which we hear so often when we have the Lord's Supper. Paul says, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. On the night that when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread, and then he goes into the passage of what the Lord shared in the breaking of bread and the passage of the cup. Now, what I want you to hear, I, I want you to hear that phrase, for I received from the Lord what I also pass on to you. Have you ever considered what you're passing on? Have you ever considered the consistency of the word itself? You know, over in 1 John, I, I, those first chapters, that, those first verses in 1 John, what was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have observed and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. That life was revealed and we have seen it and we testify and declare to you and declare to you the eternal life that was with the Father and was revealed to us. What we have seen and heard we also declare to you so that you may have fellowship along with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. 
what we have seen, what we touch, what we have heard, we pass on to you. I mean, the Gospels, the letters of Paul, I mean, the consistency and the truth of what we have heard, we have passed to you. You know, it says after our Lord Jesus Christ was raised from the dead that he met with over 500, and he spoke with them of the things and declarations of the Old Testament, and he explained to them what must happen and what did happen. And people I've heard say, oh, I wish I was there. I wish I had been there to hear that. What it was that he said. Well, guys, it's right here. <laughs> you know, what we heard, what we saw, do you think that they were sitting there all that time and John said, hmm, I wonder if I should put in what Jesus told me. It's here. It is here and it is consistent and it's truthful. Now then, what I'd like to pass on is 2 Timothy 2.2. We all have heard this, and so many of us know it by heart. You, therefore, my son, be strong. Be strong. He, he wants this to go on. He says, you, therefore, and this is the emphatic, you, therefore, in the Greek, it is an emphasis. It is you. You must do this. I command you, my son, be strong. By means of or in the power of grace. How are you strong? <coughs> It's only in the grace of God that we can be strong. Strong. How many times have we seen that in the Word of God? Be strong. Stand firm. Be a man. Paul uses this about four or five times. He uses it in Corinthians. He uses it in Philippians. He uses it in Ephesians. He uses it in 1 Timothy. He uses it here in 2 Timothy. Be strong. And we have to be that. Be strong. It's a biblical command. Link. And it's to be, it's to be firm. In the grace that is in Christ Jesus. That's the only way that we can stand firm. The grace of Jesus Christ. I can't stand firm in my own self. I can't stand firm in my own physical life. I can be frail and infirm and yet stand strong in the Lord Jesus Christ. It has nothing to do with my physical body. It has everything to do with my spiritual relationship. And it's in the grace of Christ that he is commanding, he is commanding Timothy, do this. Now, remember Timothy comes from a godly family. Over in 1 Timothy, Paul writes, he says, now, you know, well, actually the chapter before this he mentioned it. You remember your grandmother Eunice and your mother Lois, how strong they were in the Lord. And now here's Timothy. What they had heard, they had passed on. What they had, they gave to their children. And so you see this lineage and this passing on. And so standing firm, he's telling Timothy, this is what you do. And what you have heard from me, in the presence of many witnesses, commit to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. This is a best practice in missions. It is a best practice in evangelism. What I have heard, I pass on to other faithful people who will be faithful to pass it on. If you hear the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ and you hold it, then you are breaking the chain which is set in the Bible. The chain is that which I have received, I now pass on to someone else. And this is the command. Paul is saying, you heard me do it. You heard me do it in the presence of many good and faithful witnesses. And that was a very important thing in the Jewish culture. What was a witness? And it had to be two at least, two male males, you had to have them, and here he said, in the, in the presence of many faithful witnesses, you heard what I said. It was affirmed. Now what you have heard, you pass on. What you have received, you give. And so, you know, it goes back to this morning. If we're going to be spectators, then we are breaking the biblical chain of passing on what we have heard. We should leave here and we should discuss our sermons. We should discuss our Sunday school lessons. We should discuss what we have read in our daily Bible readings. What it is that the Lord has laid upon our hearts. We should say let us discuss this with those. Listen, this is what I've read. I just wanted to share it with you. What do you think? Or isn't that exciting? Or, or how would you live with that? I mean, are we doing that on a regular basis? Are we passing on what we are receiving? Or are we just soaking it in? and let it 
to stop right here. We're not to be a reservoir. We're to be a, a funnel, a tube, a pipe that just flows out with what we have received and what we've heard. And we should pass it on. And Paul is saying right here, Timothy, do this. And it's very specific. What you have heard from me, specific teachings, specific instructions, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's not saying, oh, I, you know, remember that uh, recipe I had for flatbread? Not, that's not what he's saying. He's talking about the gospel, the things of the Bible, the things of the Lord. What you have heard from me pass on to good and faithful men. In the presence of many, you heard it. Then he says, commit it. And in the Greek, this means entrust it. Teach it. To faithful men who will be able to teach others. Who will be able to teach others. <clears throat> this is hard. Please do not take it wrong. Linda and I found in our mission life, especially when we lived in the big city in Cairo and Alexandria, we seem to attract uh, people who really did not seem like they were ever going to anywhere. Westerners, foreigners. And they often came with different agendas, different ideas. We never turned anyone away. Matter of fact, I nearly drove my wife crazy because I had an open door policy for several seasons. You came at any hour, we opened the door, we gave you coffee, tea, cake. She had more sweets in the freezer than you could think of. We never turned anyone away, but there was always that one thing we had to come down and ask ourselves. Will I teach this person and will they be faithful to pass it on? Now, I know that's a question that can only be answered by the Holy Spirit, but often within your spirit, you know. You know. And you have to say, this is a different ministry than what I need right now. I need this person to be discipled and to pass it on. We did not turn people away, but we did understand that there were people that we could spend more time with than others because we knew they were going to pass it on. We knew that they were soaking it in. We knew that they would be faithful to commit it. And we need to do that. We need to look and say, are there people that will be faithful to pass it on? Are there people here, friends and relatives and loved ones, that as I share with them, I will see that they will also pass it on? Or as they share with me, I will be faithful to pass it on. And we need to look at each other and say, how can we encourage others to do that? Entrust it, teach it, and then pass it on. And then he gives three pictures. Very important. Share in the suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. This picture of a soldier, of endurance, of hardships, cut off and estranged from the world, and allegiance to the head, Christ Jesus. You know, I mean, if I give it to, a, to you as a soldier, are you, going, are you going to be true to it? Are you going to have that picture that I will forsake this? I am, I am under the authority of an army, a head, a master, Am I going to handle it in such a way that I will pass it on? Diligence. Discipline. This is what I'm going to do. And so he used this picture. And who is the head? Under the head of that of Christ Jesus. A good soldier of Christ Jesus. No one serving as a soldier gets entangled in the concerns of civilian life. He seeks to please the recruiter. <coughs> He seeks to please the one who is in ahead. And so when we're looking, and am I one who receives, and then I receive it as one with discipline. As I receive it, one with a set mind and target, I'm going to walk with the word of Christ, and I'm going to handle it with the discipline of a soldier, of the military. Paul is saying this is something that needs to be within you as a character, Paul, to Timothy. He says you need to have the character of a soldier, that lifestyle. He says, also, if anyone competes as an athlete, he is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. Interesting. What's that mean? 
What's that mean? The Olympics. There actually were Olympics during this time. Paul was an avid lover of sports. I think every time he was sewing those tents, he was sitting there talking about the latest runner, the newest wrestler, because he uses sports so many times in his illustrations. You know, I run the race. You know, I, I buffet my body. And he's sitting here going, okay, an athlete, an Olympian during that time had to come and he came to the games. He had to swear. He had to sign an oath. In some of the games, the consequences was death if they found that he had lied. That's pretty heavy. Have you been drugging? Nowadays, well, you can't compete till next year. Here, oh, were you actually signing an oath for 10 months before this appearance? I have been training. They had to sign that oath. If not, they could not compete. And so here he's saying like an athlete, you have to play by the rules. You have to swear that you have trained for 10 months. You have had that, that discipline prior to the event. It is hard working. I have put the time in. I'm ready for the race. I'm ready for the competition. As we handle the Word of God, as we receive this, as we go out to teach others, are we disciplined? Are we holding it like that, like one who is running the race and saying, yes, I have buffeted myself. I'm ready. This young couple is doing that right now. They are disciplining themselves. They are taking the training. They are preparing themselves for jungle life. They're preparing themselves for the hardships of having to learn a language, then learn the alphabet, the prepared alphabet, the script, the sounds, putting it down, and then how to write it, how to get it out there. Oh, that takes discipline, guys. It doesn't just happen. This is hard work. This takes years of work and training and time. They are buffeting themselves now as an athlete, preparing for the run, preparing for the race. So he uses this picture of the athlete. He is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. And then the last one, the farmer. Now we have farmers and we have ranchers who are here, people who are landowners and use them today. The hard work, the emphasis lies here. It is nearly a technical term with Paul. The hard working farmer. It is a man who gives all his effort full trust. Farmer plants, farmer does, but it goes back, if you would, to the parables of you plant, the Lord provides the rain, the sun, the faith that it takes that once you've done that, but the hard work of the farmer is, I believe of the hard work and trust in the Lord ought to be the first to get a share of the crops, the perseverance. <coughs> Excuse me. So these three pictures that he has given us here, these attitudes of life, how do we handle the scripture of God? What do we do one with another as we pass on these things to good fellow men and women? I mean, we, we see this. We have great Sunday school teachers in this church. We do. We have great women's Bible studies, men's Bible studies on Tuesdays. We're having the time now of men gathering together on Tuesdays and the various gatherings. What are we doing with what we hear? I mean, Jerry, I'm sorry. I really haven't sat down and talked to a lot of people about your Sunday school lessons. And that's wrong. You do such a great presentation of the Word of God every Sunday. And I'm, I'm picking on Jerry because I said in this class, I can do the same thing with Ray. And you all know that. We have teachers that handle the Word of God. Do we take that out? When our pastor steps out of this pulpit, do we take his sermon and discuss it among ourselves through the week? Do we say, how do we apply that? Do we tell others, hey, listen, man, you should have heard the sermon we heard. Let me tell you what the Word said. Or are we just soaking it in and leaving it alone? Paul says we should be taking it and passing it on to good people. And we see the illustration. John, Paul, Jesus Christ himself, that which I received, I pass on to you. It means Christ was passing on. You don't think he walked over those that time with the disciples saying, now, listen to this. There was a parable. Now let me explain that parable. 
we are to take the word of God. It is the living word, even today. We are to pass it on to others. And then there are, as we see this list, all these people groups, equaling millions, literally millions of people who do not have the word of God in their heart language. In a language that they can read, if they read it all, or in a language that they understand. But God goes ahead. God goes before us. He wants us to be there. He wants this young couple to be there. It's like this tribe that wrote the letter. When are you coming to us? You know, when we first started work with people groups back in 1988, I think. 97, I'm sorry, we made a shift in 97. In 97, we thought, well, there's people, groups out there have never heard the word of God. And there are. But you know what we started finding every time we showed up at a new people group? Shh, don't tell everybody else. God had already been there. He had already shown up in a dream or a vision. Or somebody had left the village and heard on Trans World Radio through some kind of trade language or something else the Word of God and brought it back. They might have been the only individual. They may have been the only one who had heard or thought about it or had a vision or a dream. But they were waiting for someone to come and to confirm what they had heard and seen. Yes, there are people who have not heard. There are people who have not seen. But we have to say the Word of God is so important. How will they hear? How will they know? And it's up to us, the common church member. Listen, hear that. Hear that. Yes, he was writing to Timothy. He could have been writing to you. He could have been writing to me. He is writing to us. Take the word of God and pass it on to good and faithful men. Guys, we need to wake up. We need to be sharp about what we do through the week of speaking the word of God, sharing the word of God, praying the word of God one with another, and passing it on with all the diligence of the soldier, the athlete, and the farmer. Everything within us. Just a simple word, but it is something we need to be about. I stepped on the toe. That's mine first. You're second. What are you doing with the Word of God? Are you sucking it in? Are you just holding it? Or are you sharing it and passing it on with someone else? If you haven't been, hey, this is a good week to do it. Start now. Start, start sharing with someone, asking someone within your own family, someone within the body of Christ. It is amazing how what starts with one or two all of a sudden grows to a bigger group. And from that group, even outside that group. And the Word of God will move across this, this whole area, this city, this county, this state. Let me share with you, too, what we consider best practices. And I share this just as examples, and then we'll close. When we were in Alexandria, we had a little church, a little Baptist church, we might have, on a good Sunday, have 50 people in attendance. You know, probably did not have more than maybe 25 members in the whole church. But, you know, people would come who were not church members. And the church, we just thought, was never going to grow. It just kind of rocked along. you all seen churches like that. Well, this one church member, not the pastor, decided, I'm going to start a prayer meeting in my home. I'm just going to start asking people to come and let's pray for our community. Matter of fact, you start off, let's pray for the street that our church building is on. Now, he lived on the ground floor, and everybody lived in these high-rise apartments. He was literally on the ground floor, and his shutters and his windows looked out on the street. There was no such thing as a yard. You know, when people walked by your house, they walked by your house. You know, it was, you could hear them talking outside the window. And so he would start going up and down the street saying, we're going to gather, our church here is going to gather in my home, and some of us are going to pray for the needs of this community. What do you need? Now, 
he's talking to Muslims. He was going to Muslim shopkeepers and Muslim families, and he said, what do you need? Well, my daughter has her final exit for high school test. I need to pray that she passes this. I, I have an uncle or a brother or someone who was in the hospital. I need someone to pray for me. I, I, my shop is failing. I, I need someone to pray for us to succeed and things to happen. People started sharing with him. And then what we found is while we started praying, people would come and also little papers were being pushed through the shutters, the cracks of the shutters, with prayer requests. You know, would you pray for this? The Muslims that did not want to talk to him, did not want to be seen, asking the Christians to pray for him. And that, that prayer meeting grew and it grew. And all of a sudden, as you walk down that street, it's called Green Street. And as you walk down Green Street, you would hear Muslims talking about answered prayers that God had given them. And you started hearing Muslims talking about what those Christians are about and what's going on. Guys, that works here. If you stop at the filling station and you go into family market and you meet someone and you say, did you know that we pray, we get together and we pray on Tuesdays and we get together and we pray on Wednesdays or whatever time you may want to pray. What can I pray for? That's all you have to ask. How can I pray for? Start praying. Start praying. Then another great practice, which I did not think would ever work, and it sounds terrible. I should have thought I've said that like that. But uh, it first started here in America after Vatican II, 1965. Remember, one of the great things of Vatican II was that the Pope said, hey, you can now read the Bible in modern English. And they printed that kind of good news for modern man Bible, but it had a different name. And the Pope had a disclaimer in the front saying, this is good for Catholics to read. It wasn't in Latin. Mass changed from Latin, but also the Catholics across America could read the Bible. And I don't know if you remember, 65 to about 75, churches started having Bible reading gatherings. That's all they did. Let's open up to Mark chapter 1. They'd read maybe the first chapter, have snacks, go home. That's all they did was read through the Bible. Read through a gospel. Read through Romans. People started getting saved right and left. Why? The word does not come back void. Well, now, this is where it gets weird. We had a young seminary student in Cairo. Now, he's Christian background. And he moved to a Muslim city there in Egypt. He went to the tea house. Muslim sitting all around him says, I would like to start reading the Bible here on Tuesday nights. If you'd like to come, I'm just going to read through the Bible. And if you'd like to sit and listen, please do so. And if you'd like to read, I'll provide the Bible. Guess what? Muslims started coming and reading through the Word of God with him. All of a sudden, he had a church of Muslim background believers, people who were on fire for God. Matter of fact, that church sent the first missionaries to be with our Bedouin team. They paid for these two Muslim background believing young people to come and go with us on a mission trip. that Muslims would sit down and say, let me read the Bible with you. And they came to the Lord. Have you ever thought about just asking some friends, hey, let's read the gospel this month. Let's just read through the gospel. See what God says to us, what God does for us. It doesn't take any time. You can just read a certain chapter. You can read so many verses. You can do it at the lunch hour and then go back to work or go somewhere, but the word does not come back what are things that we can do to spur ourselves on and those around us to be in the Word and to pass on that which we have received? That's our challenge. And there's other things. There's other ways. But we cannot sit and be spectators. We have to handle this living Word and see what God will do with us and through us and for us and for our community. Father, we thank you.
we thank you, Father, for Nathan, for Kelsey. Father, we have prayed over them, and we do. We, we praise your mighty name for them. And we lift them before you. May you meet their needs, Father, financially. May you meet their needs spiritually, Father. In the years ahead, may they and we also see what you do through their <coughs> lives for the tribe of people that they may be called to and that you are sending them to. And Father, for ourselves here at Westside First Baptist Church, Father, we want to handle the word that we have. We are so fortunate to have the word of God in so many translations, in so many formats, and Father, we, we can read it at any time. Matter of fact, Lord, we sometimes it's embarrassing how many Bibles we have on our shelves. And yet, Lord, we fail to pick up one. And we confess that before you. So, Lord, as we see within your word, the great men of God, the, the disciples and the apostles who passed this word to us, Father, let us be also faithful to pass it on to others. Lord, yes, we want to soak it up, but, Lord, we want to also push it out. We want to give it to those around us. So, Lord, speak to us this week. May your Holy Spirit move among us and challenge us and say, this is something that you can do. Try it. Try it. Don't hold back. Lord, that is our desire. And we pray before you in Christ's name. As is the custom here at Westside, and may it never fail or stop, we will give an opportunity for people to come to know the Lord Jesus Christ. We will always offer an invitation if there is anyone here tonight who has not received the Lord Jesus Christ, this is your opportunity. God sent His Son to die for you. He came and died for me. He shed His blood that each and every person on the face of the earth would have an opportunity to accept Him, to have their sins forgiven, to be entered into the body and the family of Christ. You have to confess your sins. You have to proclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord, that He died for your sins, and that God the Father raised Him through His power and fullness of life. And He sits now at the right hand of the Father. It's a faith step. It, it is by faith. There is nothing logical about it. It is a matter of the heart of God. It is a matter of saying, I believe. And maybe it's that point in life where you learn to have to say, help me, I'm unbelief. But I want to believe. So, Brother Paul's going to play and we're going to sing. And we're going to have a short opportunity. And I'll open it for you to make that decision for a time of rededication. Or you may have something that you'd like to lay on the altar before the Lord. But this is your chance as a family of Christ. Stay together as we sing. Wherever He leads, I will take up the cross and fall.
his feet up, move some boxes, and uh, we'll pray and let you go. Thank you so much. Thank you for being faithful in the Lord. And may the Lord bless you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you, Father, that you walk with us. Father, you direct us. You empower us. Oh, Father, you have drawn us together as the body of Christ. Lord, we want to be those who serve you. Lord, we want to be true disciples. We want to be those children, Father, that are obedient to you. And Father, as Paul has said to Timothy, we want to be those who pass on what we have heard. Father, we want to be good soldiers. We want to be good athletes. We want to be good farmers. And all those characteristics and aspects that, Father, all that we hear and learn, that, Father, you'll be glorified as we pass it on to others, that they may also know the great love of our Lord Jesus Christ. So be with us now as we leave this place, as we go into this week, that, Father, all that we say and do, you will be glorified and your kingdom will be lifted up. And the King of kings, the King of glory seen by all. It's in his mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. <coughs>